Welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, I have a guest today and a friend. His name is Jim Calvin. He is the abbot of the Cape Cod Zen Center. And I was talking to Jim before the show started because we're going to be discussing enlightenment, but I thought we, it, because he mentioned it is a path, I'd like to ask Jim, number one, how he got on this path, what inspired him, and what's an abbot? I always want to ask you that. <laughs> Uh, an abbot is the mini CEO. Ah. What, whatever needs to be done, scheduling, oh. overlooking budget, overlooking uh, retreats and the practice, just kind of overlooking everything. Okay, so there's a lot of work involved with that. Um, fun work. Fun work. Fun yeah, work. Good work. Yeah. So, so Jim, um, you have been a Buddhist for how long? Uh, officially almost 20 years, although it really began in the mid-60s when I, uh, I was in the Navy and I was stationed on Okinawa. And as soon as I got there, I just looked at the, the people and the way they lived and uh, the architecture and art, and I was just so intrigued uh, by that. So, for example, uh, several times a year, a, a family will have dinners where they set places at the table for their ancestors, oh. which was, I thought, really neat. I mean, with food. Really? Yeah. Sweet. And so I, I was intrigued by that, so I took a course on Asian philosophy, and that led me to Buddhism and Zen Buddhism, which I practiced somewhat in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And then when I got back here to New England, which was 91, uh, I joined the Quantum School of Zen, which is headquartered in Rhode Island, right. and started the, the path. You started the path. Prior to that, was your background in something totally different? I mean, well, I'm a psychologist you, so, by, by well, training. All right, so that isn't far afoot. Uh, no, actually, there's uh, quite a bit of overlap, especially with what's called cognitive psychology, which is how much our thoughts and our ideas influence our emotions and our behavior. So big overlap with Zen. Yes, I, I, I was thinking too when I I was reading something about Buddhism the other day about on feelings and, and, and embracing them and surrendering to them, that it was like I thought, oh, a therapist's dream is that people are encouraged not to run, and it's just envelop, see it through, let it dissolve, whatever it does, uh, exactly. um, but don't, don't be afraid of it. Exactly, and, that, and that's very zen. Acknowledge your feelings, don't stuff them or hide them, uh, don't be overwhelmed by them, but just confront your feelings, confront your situations. Yeah. Now, isn't that interesting, though, in the human, just the way we live, that when we've all had our moments in life where we have run and we notice that we do that, and mm -hmm. it's so easy to do, it's so easy to be in denial or to just say, I'll uh, find a way to, to hide from our feelings. It oh, seems yes. to be the ultimate challenge is to be okay with wherever, whoever, whatever is going on and whoever we are. To, to first find them and then acknowledge them and finding them uh, relates a little bit to what we'll talk about mindfulness and that is paying attention not just to your environment and the people around you but also what's going on in your head and your heart. Yes. Yes. Well, um, I teach yoga, as you know, and I've been doing a lot of Qigong. And I've noticed mm -hmm. lately, as we're moving, I'm becoming more, and I don't know if it's my Zen influence, but I'm becoming more devoted to stopping, as we do in asana, and just asking my class to feel what is going on in there, you know, just mm -hmm. to be very attentive to mm -hmm. all those the meridians and the rivers and how does it feel and your breathing. And I think, uh, as a dancer, it's kind of helped me to find a way to function as someone who appreciates Buddhism. Exactly. It's sort of the opposite of what you sometimes hear in athletics. Yeah. They say, play through the pain. <laughs> Uh, and Zen says, no, acknowledge your pain and then make a mindful decision about what to do. Yeah. So do you feel on your path to enlightenment that <laughs> there's just a process um, that as, as you walk through it happens to you? I, I don't know if that's a good question. Uh, oh, no, it's a very good question. The analogy we often use in Zen is uh, getting to enlightenment is starting with a gigantic onion <laughs> and, and one layer at a time peeling away, peeling away, peeling away till you get down to the center where there's nothing, at which point you have everything. 
That's interesting. The word emptiness is a frequently used term. Mm -hmm. And is that the core of the onion? Is this that? That's part of it, yeah. Part of it. Yeah. Uh, emptiness is, is one of the important elements uh, in enlightenment, seeking and getting enlightenment. Another word for emptiness is non-self, which means that I, Jim Calvin, existing in this skin with, with this brain and mind, don't exist. There is no Jim Calvin. I am a product of everything that has ever happened to, to me, been said to me, everything I've done. Uh, that's what I, in quotes, am. It's really a connection with my whole life. Yeah. The conditioned mind. You're a conditioned soul. You've taken in energy. You've taken in opinions. You've taken in mm -hmm. feelings about who you are. You've been told who you were, mm -hmm. correct? Oh, yeah. I mean, those can become habits, can't they? That oh, absolutely. we get very wedded to. Oh, absolutely. And, we, and then we call that habit mind. Well, I've tied my shoe a certain way for, <laughs> you know, six decades. Uh, why should I change it? And, and there's a real problem with that. Uh, because another one of the important elements of enlightenment, whatever that is, is called impermanence. We're always changing, changing, changing. And intellectually, we understand that. You know, we yeah. get older and, and everything changes. And the problem is we don't really get it in our bones, in our gut. And, and when we really get that, then we can say, well, this is how things are. I'm, I'm getting older. I don't walk as well as I used to. Someday I'm going to die. And all of that is how things are, and that's okay. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're bringing to mind the times in my life where I've had an amazing epiphany, a day where, oh, I got it. And there's, then I got smart enough after I had some of those to know <laughs> they don't last, mm. <laughs> that habits are hard to break. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you'll have that aha moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you can't get cocky about those. When you laugh, you have to have a sense of humor, right? Oh, absolutely. That as we dribble back into a habit that's very deeply embedded, when it starts to show its face again, you go, and maybe it's lighter. I have a feeling those little epiphanies, as you say, the onion peeling away, right. those are important. It's like permanent growth is permanent. You know, when you really work through an issue or a layer, it really does stay with you. Mm -hmm. And so we have to remember that um, because I've had discouraging moments of saying, where did that moment go? Mm. I had it all and it's gone, but yeah. I'm better. Well, I, I, I think that's very true. And sometimes we find that in meditation. You, you sit in meditation and you maybe leave your eyes partway open and you breathe very deeply and you get very quiet and you say to yourself, ah, oh, isn't this nice? Isn't this serene? And then uh, the bell will ring at the end of meditation. You go, oh, back to the real world again. <laughs> So we can't hang on to, the, to that 